turning to Hebrews chapter 12, please. Hebrews chapter 12. And verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel, and note that phrase by the writer to the Hebrews, one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, but it's too late afterward, you know. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. And we know the Lord will bless to us the solemn reading of this short, short passage of Scripture. A couple of Sunday mornings ago, I preached on the title a saved soul and a wasted life. A saved soul and a wasted life. I want to speak tonight on a lost soul and a wasted life. A lost soul and a life that is wasted. Now the soul that saved with a wasted life will pay a heaven a heavy penalty when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ. And I want every believer to hear that tonight. A saved soul with a wasted life will pay a heavy penalty when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ. Because we are told from the Word of God that all that you labored for and worked for that wasn't for God will be burnt up as fire, wood, hay, and stubble. It's only wise, my dear believer, if you're saved by God's grace, you're saved for a purpose, and that purpose is not to serve yourself. That purpose is not for materialistic things. It is to serve the Lord. And if you don't, you will pay a price at the judgment seat of Christ. But the soul with the double barrel dose will suffer a greater one. Because a lost soul and a lost life is an awful way to stand before God. Because with a lost soul and a lost life, you will go to the lake of fire forever. Now, one of such men in the Scripture who had a lost soul and a lost life was a man called Esau, the son of Isaac and Rebekah, the elder brother of Jacob. After living 137 years on this earth, and saturated with the things of God in his early life, his dying testimony is among the saddest, 
that you could ever read. I seldom read of it. I seldom read of these verses in Hebrews and in Genesis regarding this man that it doesn't affect me. Because we read tonight very simply and clearly that he was rejected. He was rejected. He found no place of repentance, though he sought it seriously and diligently with tears. He couldn't find it. It was too late. And I pray tonight that nobody in this meeting will come to a stage where they'll want to get saved and they can't get saved. Because I know of people tonight in our province who would come up here for me if I asked them and testify to that fact that they've tried to get saved and they can't. There's such a thing as committing the unpardonable sin, you know. And I trust tonight there's nobody here watching me or listing me across the broad acres of earth that has a lost soul and a lost life, and it's too late. Well, that's where this man was. And the tragedy about it is this, that he had godly parents. Isaac and Rebecca knew their God. Although in the later years of their life there were skirmishes in their marriage and there were problems, but they were children of the covenant promises of God. And many things regarding the God Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Jacob. Many things did Esau, did this man hear. Many things did he hear. And many things did he see. Also, he had the mighty Abraham and Sarah as their grandfather and grandmother. And like Timothy from a child, he knew the Word of God. I tell you what light and truth there was, Esau had it. And it must be an awful place for those who drop out of a godly home or a godly church or a godly community into the flames of hell. It does not bear thinking about, but it's the truth of God's Word, my friend, that it can happen. And I say to you tonight, flee, flee, young man, to your mother's Savior. Flee from the wrath to come, ere it's too late. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, doesn't matter. Come now, when you can. Don't leave it like this man did. He became full of hatred. He became full of rebellion. He wept and he prayed more than once, let me tell you. But he dug in his heels and he was lost. The Bible in Genesis 25, and I don't want you to turn to this, I, I'm sure you're familiar enough with it. Regarding Esau, it tells us some things about him. It calls him a cunning hunter, a man of the field. Now, the word cunning means to be sold out to something. Now, hear me tonight, please. The word cunning means to be sold out to something. The word hunter means to search and seek diligently. 
And let me say that that word hunter is always used in the Bible in evil connections. There were two men. One was Nimrod, the mighty hunter, who was a type of the Antichrist, who was the, who was the devil incarnate, uh, built the Tower of Babel. One was Nimrod, and the other was Esau. So let's get that into your head. Cunning means to be sold out to something. A hunter means to seek and search diligently for something. And he was a man of the field, and the field speaks of the world. So we have a young man, and he is a young man, and he's searching and he's seeking with all his heart. But he can't get set aside. He hunts until he exhausts himself, but he cannot find. He cannot find anything to satisfy him. And my friend, the world cannot satisfy you tonight. You'll see them all at the World Cup and they're drinking and they're dancing and they're shouting and everything's going, everything's going well for the English fan as long as English, England's winning. But you see when they're turfed out of the whole thing, you see, get a look at them. You see, there's nothing out there tonight that, that's lasting. There's nothing out there tonight that can satisfy. But whosoever drinketh of the water Jesus said that I give, he have everlasting life. There's everlasting life. There's peace. There's contentment to be found in Christ. This man was a man of the world. He was hunting in the fields. He was searching and seeking continually for things, but they could never satisfy him. We'll see that as we come to a close. Nothing could satisfy. Now, none but Christ can satisfy. No other name for me. There's love and life and lasting joy, Lord Jesus, found in thee. Hallelujah. I'm satisfied tonight. I don't know about you. It doesn't sound as if you are. But I'm satisfied tonight in Christ, and what he has done for me, and what he has given for me. In Genesis 25 and verse 29, we read this about him. He came in from the field, faint and tired and hungry, with no venison. He had been out hunting, and he came back from the field empty. And my friend, that's just the world tonight. They're empty. They're coming in empty. There's nothing, not one thing can fill that vacancy, that void in their life that they're exhausting themselves, searching for, crying for, calling for. And every time they get something, it's stolen away from them again by the devil because it can't last and it won't last for Christ is all that will last. And then Jacob nailed them. Jacob nailed them and swindled him from the birthright. And what an, awe, an interesting story it is. So that's my second heading. He had godly parents, but he had a great possession. And they're not material, worldly possessions, although he had plenty of them too. But his great possessions was his birthright. And he bartered it to his brother Jacob for a bowl of stew, for one mess of pottage. He fiddled and trifled away the greatest thing that a Jewish person could possess, his birthright and his blessing. Do you know what the birthright meant to a Jew? It meant this. He was the head of the house. He was in charge of the priesthood. He had access to the Holy Land. He, and, and cursing through his veins, uh, cursing through his veins was the lineage of the Messiah. It was one of the greatest privileges that could be stowed upon a Jewish person was the birthright, and it belonged to him. But for one morsel, he lost it. He says, I don't want it. I don't want it. He rejected it, and because he rejected it, he was rejected. And my friend, because you reject the greatest blessing, the greatest gift that ever can come to mankind, if you reject it, you too will be rejected. Make no mistake about that. You cannot trample underneath your foot the blood of Christ. 
You can't do it. You can't say, I'll not have this man to rule over me continually and continually. You cannot sit in meetings. You cannot be brought up in a Christian home. You cannot hear the gospel. You can't have a saved wife and a saved husband and saved children. You can't go on and on and on continually saying to the Lord, I don't want you. I don't want you. I don't want you. Because there'll come a day when you'll be rejected forever. And that's what happened to him. This was his, but he sold it. Tell me, what are you selling yourself for tonight? Be honest before God. Remember Judas, it was a few pieces of silver. What are you bartering Christ for tonight? What are you putting before him tonight? What are you saying I'd rather have than Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who loved you and gave himself for you? What are you saying tonight? And well, why is it that you're not saved? Why is it that you haven't bowed the knee yet? Why is it that you haven't repented of your sins yet? Why is it that you haven't embraced my Savior tonight? Why is that? There's some reason for it. It may be only one thing, but that one thing's enough to damn you. He had great possessions, godly parents, and great possession. He had this gift that was given to him that he refused. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Oh, reach out and receive him tonight. You have nothing to do when he take it tonight, it's here. He died, he rose again, he can do nothing more. And he says, come for all things are now ready. But thirdly, godly parents and a great possession, there was genuine penitence. And I hope you have your Bible open because I'm going to close and I'm going to be done in good time tonight. I'm going to close by expounding a couple of words from these verses that we read. And we're at verse 16 of Hebrews 12, if you closed your Bible, because God showed me this, and this is very important. There was genuine penitence. Genuine penitence. It was with tears, but he couldn't find it. Now, I want you just to let that sink in tonight, because this, this is serious. And I believe that I'm speaking to somebody somewhere, maybe in New Zealand. We had someone on from New Zealand not so long ago. Somewhere, somewhere tonight, God's speaking to somebody, and this is your last opportunity to get saved. And maybe we're speaking to somebody tonight, and you're past that. There's no hope. There's no hope. And you can have all the repentance and all the tears that you like. But it'll not work. And I'll tell you why it happened with Esau. You're at verse 16, are you? Lest there be any fornicator. Well, that's one one thing that he's described as in the Word of God, that's sexual. A fornicator is one who sleeps around. No respect for marriage vows, no respect for morality. And the Apostle Paul has much to say about fornication. And if you have a good Bible at home, big Bible dictionary, a concordant at your home, you just look up the word fornication. Now, here's what you will discover. And this, 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 this is enlightening. The word forno is the same word as we get the word porno from. And if you have 
a strong, a, a strong concordance, which I have, and you look up the word forno, here's what strong translates as, as a male prostitute. Now, we're touching on very, on very sensitive things here. I'm only telling you what the Word says. So he had a sexual problem, this fella. I don't know to what extent or to what degree, but there was something got in to his life. And that invariably comes, you know, after rejecting Christ. Comes. And we're living in that very day. And remember the Apostle Paul says this, that fornicators, adulterers, and sodomites will not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what the Bible says. I don't care what Nolan says or anybody else. That's what the Bible says. And if we're not true to the Word, we're true to nothing. So there's no hope of heaven unless they repent. This fellow has gone to this extent here where he's described by the writer to the Hebrews as a fornicator, as sexual. Then the, we go on to read that he was our profane person. That's verbal. Profanities would have come out of his mouth one after the other. Blaspheming oaths. We're talking about a fellow that was brought up in a godly home. We're talking about a man who had the, the chosen birthright of his people. And something has happened because we're coming to his end here. And I tell you, he's a very interesting study if you want to go into him as a character. Yes, that word, that word, profane, is the word blaspheming. But it also is translated as one who tramps over something. It's a very interesting word, that. One that tramps his feet over something. In other, other words, he just walks right over it. Well, that's what he did with his birthright. And so the writer's painting a picture of one here who cannot find repentance. And then it goes on to say, lest there be any fornicator profane person, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. When he wanted the blessing, when he wanted to have it, when he saw his mistake, when he saw his fault, when he saw what was happening, when he saw the state that he was in, when he saw the doom that was before him, it says he found, when he was rejected, he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He wept, and he cried, and he pleaded, and it was too late. Now, notice what it says. He, he, he sought it carefully, diligently, prayerfully, weeping for it, crying for it, crying for it. But he couldn't get it back from the Father because Isaac had given it to Jacob, and it was a covenant promise, and it was too late. Oh, my dear friend, tonight, 
This is serious stuff. And you would say to me, a nice summer's evening and not many people in, what are you preaching like this for? I'm preaching like this because it's the word the Lord gave me to preach. And I don't know where you are tonight or where you stand tonight, but I tell you this. Don't leave it too late. Don't miss the great blessing that God has for you in Christ. Don't further away your time until your conscience becomes seared, until you enter into these sort of things here, and you'll curse and you'll swear and you'll sin, and it'll take nothing out of you. And there's no use in trying to find Christ when you can't. My spirit shall not always strive with man. Wouldn't you be far better tonight to go home or stay on in this meeting and see some of us or go home and get down before God and say, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. You know, I believe that that's what David in that repentant psalm in Psalm 51, when he, when he cried, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, that he was afraid of God doing to him what he did for Saul, for he took the Holy Ghost away from Saul and he died a fool. Don't die a fool. Don't die with this offer of great blessing and the blessings of Christ and the fullness of Calvary and all that he has for you tonight. And you just sell it for one bit, for one morsel, for one man or one woman. Are you afraid or ashamed or whatever it would be? I don't know. Oh, don't barter it away for some relationship. Don't barter it away for some job. Some sin that's hindering you and keeping you back. Flee to Christ tonight. And he'll take you in. And he'll receive you. And he'll give you peace with God and assurance of heaven. I tell you, it's great. It's great to be saved. Forty-four years passed. It's great to be saved. And I'm glad that the morning that I called on him that he heard me. And you call on him tonight with all your heart. Don't end up like this man. Genuine penitence. Genuine repentance. Everything that he could get. Everything that he could muster. But he had gone too far. And how sad, awful sad that would be. A lost soul and a lost life. A lost soul. And invariably, if you have a lost soul, you have a lost life. Jesus said about Judas Iscariot, he says this, that it would be better for that man that he was never born. That came from the lips of the Savior himself to Judas, one of his disciples. It would be better. Better. That he was never born. We have to say that about Esau too. We have to say it about any man or woman that departs from this life without Christ. Because what is life if it's not in Christ? It's nothing.